Thank you for joining us today for another presentation of Let the Bible Speak with your speaker, Brett Hickey. Welcome to Let the Bible Speak. Friends, you encourage me. You watch Let the Bible Speak not to hear sweet stories, a comic routine, or to have your conscience sabbed. Instead, you're eager to join in a sincere search to better understand and live out God's will. If you know others truly interested in God's word, please invite them to study the Bible with us. Richard Dawkins is one of many atheists who has ridiculed Christians for believing in unicorns. He places unicorns in the same category as tooth fairies. We read about unicorns in the Bible. Is there such thing as a unicorn? We'll be right back to answer that question after our song. is it that the King James Version of the Bible talks about unicorns? I'm indebted to others who have put together all the interesting interrelated pieces of this puzzle that we'll notice today. When you look up the word unicorn in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, the first definition recorded reads, quote, a mythical, usually white animal generally depicted with the body and head of a horse with long flowing mane and tail, and a single, often spiraled horn in the middle of its forehead. When people today hear the word unicorn, that image emerges in their minds. No human has ever witnessed such an animal, and there has never been one found in the fossil record. Therefore, atheists and the avowed enemies of Scripture insist that the Bible is an unreliable book that promotes fiction 
and scientific disciplines. But is the one-horned white horse the animal that the Bible speaks about repeatedly? No. Notice the second definition for unicorn in the same Merriam-Webster dictionary. Quote, an animal mentioned in the Bible that is usually considered an aurochs, a one-horned rhinoceros, or an antelope. Now, this secondary definition demonstrates that there is ambiguity considering, concerning which animal the Bible is speaking of. This shows, secondly, that the association with the tooth fairy is unnecessary. The reliability of this conclusion becomes even stronger upon further investigation. Actually, in 1828, Noah Webster's first edition dictionary has, for the first definition of the word unicorn, quote, an animal with one horn, the monoceros. This name is often applied to the rhinoceros. This dictionary says nothing about a horse-like animal or some mythical animal. Why? Obviously. The modern definition of a white, one-horned, horse-like animal had not been invented in 1828, over 200 years after the King James Version of the Bible appeared. Instead, the unicorn is equated with a one-horned rhinoceros. Incidentally, the same dictionary points out that the word comes from the Latin Unicornus, which literally means one horn. If you're thinking, wait a minute, the rhinoceros has two horns. Please reserve judgment until you hear some additional information. Now consider that this same 1828 Webster's Dictionary defines the word rhinoceros, which means literally in Latin nose horn, a genus of quadrupeds or four-legged animals, of two species, one of which, the unicorn, has a single horn growing almost erect from the nose. This animal, when full grown, is said to be 12 feet in length. There is another species with two horns, the bicornus. They are natives of Asia and Africa." End quote. Clearly, there were two animals described as rhinoceros, a one-horned animal called a unicorn and a similar animal with two horns called a bicornus. In review, less than 200 years ago, a standard dictionary definition of a unicorn pointed to a one-horned rhinoceros, and the definitions of rhinoceros pointed to animals, one of which was a horned animal called a unicorn. Of even further significance, the scientific name for the Asian one-horned rhinoceros is the Latin name rhinoceros unicornis while the black rhinoceros bears the Latin name Diceros bicornis. The Bible says in Psalm 92, verse 10, But my horn shalt thou exalt like the horn of a unicorn. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. That word unicorn is translated unicornis in the Latin Vulgate. Unicornis is the same Latin name used in the scientific name for the one-horned rhinoceros. The King James Version reads in Job 39, verse 9, Will the unicorn be willing to serve thee or abide by thy crib? In the Latin Vulgate, the word translated unicorn is rhinoceros. How about that? In the Latin Vulgate Bible, the Latin translation of the Bible produced over 16 centuries ago, we find the Latin word rhinoceros. That Latin word rhinoceros is translated unicorn in the King James Version of Job 39.9. I understand that the five different Latin words are used in the nine different Old Testament instances where we find the word unicorn or unicorns. Rhinoceros, rhinoceratus, rhinocerata, unicornium, and unicornis. In 2003, Eric Dinnerstein wrote a book titled The Return of the Unicorns, the Natural History and Conservation of the Greater One-Horned Rhinoceros. Scientists today refer to an extinct animal as the giant unicorn that is merely a one-horned relative of the modern rhinoceros, Elasmotherium sibiricum. Some people believe that this is the unicorn 
mentioned in the Old Testament in places like Job 39, verse 10. Quote, Canst thou bind the unicorn with his band in the furrow? Or will he harrow the valleys after thee? End quote. One writer explains why some Old Testament passages use the Latin word rhinoceros or a derivative, while other scriptures use the Latin word unicornis or unicornium. The text of Psalm 92 verse 10 shows that a single horned rhinoceros is under consideration when the Bible says, but my horn shalt thou exalt like the horn of a unicorn. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. The word unicorn here comes from the Latin unicornis or one horn. In Deuteronomy 33 verse 17, however, where Moses is writing about the blessing on Joseph, the context indicates a two-horned rhinoceros. His glory is like the firstling of his bullock, and his horns, plural, are like the horns of unicorns. With them he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth, and they are the ten thousands of Ephraim, and they are the thousands of Manasseh. Moses tells us that Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, are represented by two horns. Interestingly, the footnote by the word unicorns has in my King James Bible an unicorn. The Hebrew word translated unicorns is actually singular, so it should be rendered unicorn. But the word horns is plural and properly translated. So we have plural horns on a single unicorn. But since a unicorn doesn't have two horns, it could not be a unicorn. That's why the Latin does not have unicornus, but has rhinoceros, indicated, indicating that the two-horned rhinoceros is in view. The two-horned rhinoceros has a larger horn and a smaller horn. This fits with the language of Deuteronomy 33, 17, where the smaller horn would represent the thousands of Manasseh, but the larger horn would represent the ten thousands of Ephraim. Both of these Bible facts correspond with the prophecy of Joseph's father, Jacob, in Genesis 48, beginning with verse 47. And when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him, and he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head. And Joseph said unto his father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn, Manasseh, put thy right hand upon his head. And his father refused and said, I know it, my son, I know it. He, Manasseh, also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly his younger brother, Ephraim, shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. The Bible statement that Ephraim shall be greater corresponds to the ten thousands of Ephraim, further represented, according to Scripture, by the larger horn of the rhinoceros. We see the Bible use of the word unicorn is not used to detail a mythical, nonsensical creature, but we see that the word unicorn describes what the average person today refers to as a one-horned rhinoceros, and what the scientific community would call the rhinoceros unicornis. While we discuss atheists attempt to ridicule the Bible as an unscientific and even anti-scientific book, let us consider the smear attempt as it relates to the topic of dinosaurs. The question is asked by the skeptic, if the Bible is truly the Word of God, why is it completely silent on the topic of dinosaurs? How could Scripture be silent on the topic? Additionally, evolutionary scientists claim the dinosaurs lived millions and millions of years ago, while many Bible believers claim that the earth and everything on it are only thousands of years old. First of all, the first English translations of the Bible appeared in the 1500s, and the translators of the King James completed their great work in 1611, over 200 years before anyone even uttered the English word dinosaur. Eric Lyons points out in an apologeticpress.org article that some of what we know from their fossils as dinosaurs today may have been referred to as dragons in the distant past. He writes, Numerous cultures throughout the world possess ancient stories about dragons that closely resemble what we today would call dinosaurs. 
which is to be expected if dinosaurs and humans actually lived together. From ancient texts in Mesopotamia, China, and Europe, creatures with scaly skin, slender necks, and long tails are described. In Far Eastern countries such as China, dragons often are described in ancient writings. Some of them are said to have been domesticated and even were used to pull the chariots of Chinese rulers. Also, many of the ancient Chinese people are said to have used dragon bones for special medicines and potions. While visiting the continent of Asia in the 1200s, Italian explorer Marco Polo said that he saw long reptiles called lindworms that easily ran as fast as a horse. In the British Isles, Hundreds of dragon stories have come down to the present day. One account told of an animal with a crested head, teeth like a saw, and a long tail. Also, in the year 1449 in England, it was reported that two huge reptiles were seen fighting on the banks of the river Stour. The epic poem, Beowulf, describes a battle in Denmark between a man named Bo Beowulf and a terrible monster called Grindel. Beowulf was a real person. He lived from A.D. 495 to 583 and was king of a group of people known as the Gaetengas. Grindel was a bipedal creature or a creature that walked on two legs that possessed large, powerful jaws and had small, weak forearms. Beowulf slew him, you may recall, by tearing off one of those limbs. As Bill Cooper inquired, quote, is there a predatory animal from the fossil record known to us who had two massive hind legs and two comparatively puny forelimbs? There is indeed. Could it be Tyrannosaurus rex? Why not? The description of Grindel, recorded sometime before the 10th century AD, over nine centuries before the relatively recent discovery of dinosaur fossils, more closely resembles the Tyrannosaurus rex than any animal alive today. While evolutionary atheists and other skeptics suggest that men could not possibly coexist with such massive, vicious beasts, the same writer also points out that man not only coexists with dinosaur-sized animals, but has managed to a certain extent to domesticate huge, powerful creatures that in a one-on-one -on -one battle with man by their mere strength and size could squash a man like a bug and devour him like an evening snack. Lyons writes, Whales are the largest animals of which we are aware that have ever existed on earth. Larger than any shark, elephant, or dinosaur. Blue whales have been known to weigh as much as 400,000 pounds, 200 tons possess a heart the size of a Volkswagen Beetle, and have a tongue large enough to hold 50 people. Imagine that. Yet humans have hunted many species of whales for centuries. Furthermore, whale researchers and photographers have been able to get close enough to touch these massive creatures in the open ocean. Lyon continues, Killer whales, also called orcas, are another one of God's magnificent creatures with which we live on the earth. Orcas are one of the ocean's fiercest predators, able even to kill much larger whales, including blue whales, when swimming in packs, referred to as pods. They hunt so well that very few animals can escape their predatory practices. Orcas eat hundreds of thousands of pounds of mammal and fish meat every year. Seals, sea lions, walruses, otters, polar bears, and even a moose have all been found in the stomachs of these ferocious creatures. Amazingly, these incredible killing machines weighing up to 11,000 pounds can be captured, tamed, and trained to do all sorts of things. The famous orcas living at SeaWorld in Orlando, Florida, occasionally take their trainers for rides on their backs. Trainers of orcas have even been known to stick their heads into the whale's mouths, which usually hold about 40 to 56 large, three-inch long teeth without fear of getting bitten.
Someone asked, yeah, but what about land animals? Lyons presents the case of the elephant, which weighs well over 100 times as much as the average man does, at 22,000 pounds. Over 2,200 years ago, the empire of Carthage, led by its famous general Hannibal, used tame African elephants to cross the Swiss Alps and battle the Romans. Today, many elephants still are being controlled by man. Tamed elephants are used in various Asian countries in religious ceremonies or to do physical labor like hauling lumber or transporting people from place to place. Elephants also are frequently seen performing at circuses. Amazing, is it not? That humans have trained these creatures, which can outweigh them by as much as 20,000 pounds, to perform some of the same tricks we train dogs to perform. While the size, strength, and ferocity of many animals today would intimidate us in a one-on-one -on -one battle, God blessed us with the intelligence and physical strength to maintain control over all animals. The Bible says in Genesis 1:28, "Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth." Skeptics argue that man and dinosaur could not possibly have coexisted. But Eric Lyons resists this conclusion. Ancient paintings, figurines, rock carvings, and other such illustrations also have been found throughout the world that point to a time when dinosaurs and humans once roamed this earth together. He goes on to write, One cannot help but wonder, if they never did coexist, as evolutionists would have us believe, what logical explanation can be given for the existence of hundreds of dragon legends and the thousands of artifacts that either describe or depict these creatures hundreds or thousands of years before modern man began learning about dinosaurs as a result of the fossil record? And what explanation can be given about what animals are represented by the biblical presentations of behemoth? And Leviathan. We read in Job chapter 40, beginning with verse 15. Look now at the behemoth, which I made along with you. He eats grass like an ox. See now, his strength is in his hips, and his power is in his stomach muscles. He moves his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are tightly knit. His bones are like beams of bronze, his ribs like bars of iron. He is the first of the ways of God. Only he who made him can bring near his sword. Surely the mountains yield food for him, and all the beasts of the field play there. He lies under the lotus trees in a covert of reeds and marsh. The lotus trees cover him with their shade. The willows by the brook surround him. Indeed, the river may rage, yet he is not disturbed. He is confident, though the Jordan gushes into his mouth. Though he takes it in his eyes, or one pierces his nose with a snare. Sounds like a dinosaur to me. Evolutionists suggest that the writer refers to an elephant, rhino, or hippo. One huge problem. This beast, quote, moves his tail like a cedar, while the elephant, rhino, and hippo move their tails like a twig. Meanwhile, fossil records show massive tails for dinosaurs like the sauropod. In addition, fossils of a T-Rex that have been found that are supposedly 65 million years old that contain soft tissue. Now, soft tissue may unusually be preserved for 65 years or perhaps even 650 years. But how could they possibly be preserved for 65 years? million years. The attacks of skeptics on the scriptures are like hammers, hammers beating on an anvil. God's word cannot be broken. Stay with us for closing words after our song. Would you be free from the
Thank you for watching Let the Bible Speak. Contact us for a free copy of 1465, What About the Unicorn? You may also request our Bible course at no charge. Gain rapid access to audio, videos, and transcripts through our Let the Bible Speak app. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to watch the new sermon every week at your convenience. Finally, we echo the sentiment of the Apostle Paul when he wrote in Romans 16, verse 16, the churches of Christ salute you. Until next week, goodbye, and may God bless you.